it is really my pleasure and an honor for me to introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. Franklin Odo. Um, he's worn many hats. Uh, he recently retired as a founding director of the Smithsonian Institute's Asian Pacific American uh, Center in 2010 and as chief of the Asian Division in the Library of Congress in 2011. As a director of the APA program in the Smithsonian, Dr. Odo has brought numerous exhibits to the Smithsonian, highlighting the experiences of Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Filipino Americans, Vietnamese Americans, Korean Americans, and Indian Americans, etc., etc. Right. Um, some of his efforts include a photo exhibit entitled Through My Father's Eyes, which featured Filipino American photographer Ricardo Alvarado at the National Museum of um, American History. Um, he also co-organized a traveling exhibit of Korean American contemporary artists entitled Dreams and Reality, and he has led um, projects to commemorate the centennial um, of Filipino immigration to the United States, and he, is, uh, he also has um, co-curated um, a, a project called Exit Saigon, Enter Little Saigon, um, which highlights the growth of the Vietnamese American community. Most of us know him, you know, by his work, his really pathbreaking work, you know, at the Smithsonian Institute, by really showcasing the histories and experiences, you know, to a public audience. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't say something about his um, academic work, um, scholarship and teaching um, as well, which has been really, truly influential and deserves equal recognition. Franklin was trained in Asian studies, um, originally, but became incredibly involved in the 1960s and 1970s and um, really uh, became part of the movement to form Asian American studies and ethnic studies in California as well as all over the country. Over the past 30 years, he's taught in a number of institutions, including UCLA, um, Occidental College, um, Cal State Long Beach, um, University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, as well as the University of Maryland, University of Pennsylvania, Hunter College, Columbia, and um, Princeton, soon to be coming here, right? <laughs> but, you know, as you see, he has been, and I read recently in um, a student newspaper in Princeton that there is a, an association of his teaching at an institution and activism among students for, um, for advocating for Asian American Studies programs. So, um, you saw that. I, I read that, yes, and uh, so, you know, if any university that needs to form, you know, a program, invite, you know, Franklin Odo to teach, I think he's been very inspirational, you know, to the students. Um, uh, his publications include um, the first breakthrough Asian American anthology called Roots, an Asian American reader, which was published in 1971, um, that was co-edited with Amy Tachiki, um, Eddie Wong, and Buck Wong. Um, in 1985, he published a pictorial history of the Japanese in Hawaii, um, 1885 to 1924. He um, is also the editor of the Columbia Documentary History of the Asian American Experience. And most recently, he, uh, and this is the reason for his visit, is to talk about his new book on um, voices from the cane fields. Um, finally, most recently in, 19, in uh, 2008, Franklin Oda was awarded the President's Award by the Japanese American Citizens League, as well as an award from the Organization of Chinese Americans. And in, in 2012, he received the Association for Asian American Studies Lifetime Achievement Award. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Franklin Oda. Thanks, Checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I, I, I have a, a, a DVD <clears throat> uh, a sampler that I want to show when other people come in. I'm told at about 12:30, maybe, so I don't have to subject it all to, to this. It's, it's just a five-minute sampler for a PBS documentary that's being uh, completed as, as we speak. <clears throat> So I thought I'd um, start with some of the, um, since, since most of you are professionals in the field in one, one way or the other, um, talk about uh, where, what I think, I'll give you a brief synopsis of what these things are. So they're, the Holy Holy Bushi 
are, bushi is a Japanese term for melody or tune. Holy moly is a native Hawaiian word for dead or dying sugarcane leaves. So one of the jobs on the plantations was to strip the leaves, these, these leaves, uh, extraneous leaves from the stalks, so that the energy um, from the roots would go into the cane, forming sugar and not be wasted in the leaves. And the leaves then could become um, uh, fertilizer for the cane. So, um, so there are all kinds of jobs <clears throat> on, the, on the plantation. So this is one of them. And the, the, um, it was considered one of the lighter jobs as opposed to cutting the cane or carrying the stalks, um, loading them onto rail cars or, or um, down, down the flumes and so on. So they were often, often not always, give, assigned to women or, or, or boys. But, um, and, and so when, when the DVD starts to play, you'll see uh, um, uh, wording that indicates that these are women's songs. And <clears throat> so that's one of the significance of, of these, that they're women's voices they're directly from uh, women who are not always heard from Im in immigrant stories. Um, but they're not only women's songs. In fact, many of them are androgynous or are clearly from men's points of, of view as well. But there are a number, and, I, and I'll, I think it's always fun to show you exactly why we know that they are women's perspectives, because they have to do with sex. And, and so you'll want to stay at least for that section. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> um, and, and partly because people don't normally think of Issei Japanese or immigrant women as being that raunchy. I mean, they, but you know, if, you know, if you know immigrant women, if you really know immigrant women and have been around them, you know they're really dirty. I mean, they, they, they are earthy folks. And, and so, um, particularly if they're peasant, uh, of peasant stock, I mean, you know, this, this is who they were. And one of the things that intrigues me about trying to uh, get the word out on this is that, is that I think there are people in my community, the Japanese American community of scholars and um, journalists and people who are, who, who tend to slide into this thing about, um, uh, yes, they were hardworking and put a value in education, you know, sort of the background to model minority stuff. And, 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 and it, I think eliding into cultural superiority things sometimes of why Japanese Americans succeeded and forgetting that um, in many cases they didn't. And there were some, some folks who really were uh, victims of this whole episode of the immigrant experience. So anyway, it's nice to prod people into um, saying, you, you know, listen, uh, things weren't quite that simple uh, in, in the past. So, so that's one of the beauties, I think, of these songs. So, so these songs are anonymous. They're like all folk songs. So nobody knows who composed which ones. So the, the, the image then is of these uh, pe people who have brought um, <clears throat> uh, folk songs from uh, Japan, from the homeland. So they sing the songs with the, the lyrics that existed, that they knew. But the, the so these particular songs were um, work songs, and they're probably from Hiroshima, we think. Uh, and which makes sense because that's the largest, that, that's the prefecture from which the largest group of Japanese immigrants came as contract workers in the late 19th century. To set the chronological stage beginning in 1885 or so into 1920, when, when immigration basically is halted completely, um, and no more even picture parts are coming into Hawaii. Perhaps a couple hundred thousand Japanese uh, go to Hawaii. Almost the same number go to the mainland, to the continent, uh, a little over 100,000, I think. But it's a lot of people, and by, ni by 1900, um, maybe 40% of the total population of Hawaii is Japanese, of Japanese descent. I think over 50% of the laborers are of Japanese descent. So there's a huge, the, the very untidy um, racial hierarchy, uh, beginning at the top with 
a relatively small group of white um, Euro European American businessmen and missionary descended folks um, who form what we later call the Big Five, uh, uh, holding companies which control the sugar uh, plantations. Um, so you so you have a, a clearly demarcated group of uh, oligarchs who are who are uh, totally European American. Then a, a more ambiguous group of, of folks like Puerto Ricans and Portuguese who are <coughs> hi come in um, <coughs> who are sort of occupy a middle ground and and the Portuguese in particular the Puerto Ricans are still pretty much considered people of color. In, in, in Hawaii and occupy kind of working class um, uh, occupations. The Portuguese have a very strange um, uh, um, place in this racial hierarchy in the middle because they're, they're employed as overseers um, on the plantation. So their job is to extract the maximum amount of labor from the workers, the contract workers in particular, who at first were Native Hawaiian, then as their population decreases and dies out, Chinese who were um, imported beginning in the 1850s, uh, J Japanese, uh, Japanese beginning in the 1880s, uh, Koreans in 1903, uh, Okinawans in 1906, Filipinos in 1906. Um, but really the, 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 the basic workforce <coughs> from 1900 on becomes uh, Japanese and Filipino. And that's the racial dynamic. Um, so, the, so the Portuguese are, are placed um, in between. Um, so they do their job. They, they <coughs> extract uh, as much labor as they can from the workforce. So they're hated for that. They're, despised, they're, they're hated for, um, for doing their job. They're despised by the haole. Haole is a Native Hawaiian term for foreigner, I guess. <coughs> um, they're, they're despised by the white, by the European American uh, elite for being um, who they are, and they're mostly from the Azores and Madeira, and so they're as much African as they are European in terms of culture, but they're Portuguese basically. <clears throat> so, so here, so so this is the kind of the setting, which I I think, <clears throat> and I think most um, social scientists would agree. Uh, <clears throat> continues to impact the uh, racial and political and social di cultural dynamics of the population of Hawaii, which is which helps to explain why um, you, you can get a Linda Lingo, who's a Republican governor, as part of an outside uh, force, and still have a largely Japanese American uh, House of Representatives and Senate. The elected officials are largely. <clears throat> Asian, <clears throat> and to a large extent, uh, uh, many of them are Japanese Americans. So you, you still have um, Maisie Hirono, who I have to tell you, who ha has this. Um, <clears throat> she's not usually um, perceived as being funny or human, even. I mean, she's kind of like a very dour, uh, uh, serious um, uh, political uh, factor. So she's. She probably has the, the most liberal voting record in the entire Senate, so the most progressive person in the Senate. So that for that, people respect her or hate her, depending on your point of view. But I remember her saying at one, at one, um, on one occasion, she says, well, people, somebody asked her, okay, so you, 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 you like to say you're the first senator who was born? Um, outside of the United States, although I'm not sure if that's true, because she was born in Japan. She's the first Buddhist and the first Japanese American woman, but, but, um, <clears throat> but you're not gay. So, so her response was, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I thought that was a really funny um, comeback, you know, from, from her. <clears throat> anyway, so there's Maisie and um, Colleen Hanabusa. So there are two, at least two out of the four a congressional delegation who are Japanese American, but it's been three or sometimes four out of four in the, in the recent past. So Japanese Americans are still a major, major influence in, in, in Hawaii, a 
as a, as a political and, and cultural force. Um, <clears throat> and part of that has to do with uh, the large numbers who were there uh, in, uh, during the plantation period. So um, um, it's almost 12.30, because I, cause I, I can't sing. Um, um, I, want, I do, I do want to play the, the DVD, but we, maybe you can wait for five minutes and let, see if there are stragglers who come in. <coughs> um, so the, the, the fact that the, the um, I, I think for Japanese American or Asian American historiography, looking at, at sources, thinking about if, what we think of as eph ephemeral sources, we used to think about that as with oral history as being not you know, historians thought about that as not being particularly valid. Some people still don't think it's especially valid. Um, and and we, we know there are fallacy, you know, there are potential pitfalls in relying on, on people's memories. But um, to me, it's, it's also true that people lie when they write. You know? <laughs> so, so journalists do that all the time. <laughs> so why, why do we think that journalists in, in the 19th century didn't lie as, as well or, or distort um, the, the, the facts. So they all have to be used judiciously. But these songs, um, and, they, and because they were brought by the, by the immigrants and were sung, uh, uh, they were occupational songs. In Japan, um, <clears throat> as in many places, I think, every occupation had its particular culture. So, so one of the ways this was expressed in Japan was through folk songs, minyo, uh, and, and they were songs for uh, woodcutters, for people who drove uh, wagons or um, took care of the horses, uh, people who, who uh, collected seaweed, people who planted um, uh, rice, people who uh, cut the rice, who harvested the rice, people who threshed the rice, and it's the rice threshing songs, momizuri uta, who, which we think are the most likely um, songs on which the Holy Holy Bushi are actually based. So we, there, there's some argument about this from people who, who've tried to explore this, but that's the um, most likely explanation that, that I've seen. Uh, <clears throat> so they come, and the likelihood is that they, set, they sang the songs in the field, and then as it was a, a, a Japanese, uh, Japanese tradition, they would insert their own lyrics to reflect their own the, the work that was being done, the hardships they suffered, the joys that they um, uh, embraced, and uh, um, nostalgia that they felt for the for the home country. And and so we have. My guess is there must have been thousands of songs that arose spontaneously out of uh, out of the fields. Um, and so, and, and and I have no proof for this, but I think. There must have been a Darwinian kind of process by which only the songs that mattered the most to the people were resung and then kept until these people were, were retired. Because nobody captured those songs um, while they were working. So we don't have songs being sung in the field. What we have are um, recordings from the 1960s and 1970s by a man, Mr. Urata, whom you'll see on, on the videotape, um, uh, who took his uh, Wallensack, a quarter-inch reel-to-reel tape recorder, for those of you who are old enough to know about those, uh, from island to island, found um, people who had actually worked on the sugar plantations, re interviewed them, recorded them, and um, in the 80s, uh, gave, gave them to me. We were on a program, which you, you, you will also see reference to, a television program, um, one of which was called, uh, the, the series was called Rice and Roses, take off on uh, bread and roses. So, so Rice and Roses had a, um, a program on, on um, KGT, uh, public television, in, in Hawaii. And I, um, Mr. Urata was there. And, so in the, in the late 80s, he said, you know, I, you know, I have all this stuff on tape. I've transcribed some of them into um, Romaji, uh, Japanese, um, but Roman script. <clears throat> but I'm not going to do anything with this. So he gave them to me and uh, said, you have to write the book. <laughs> I 
said, oh, <laughs> I'm a little busy. <laughs> so, so in fact, it took me 30 years, you know, from 1984 to uh, 2014, to really um, put this to, to print. And I actually do really, really feel bad about this, because he died in 2009. Mm -hmm. And so he never saw the book. The only um, sort of consolation I have is that I was able in, I forget, 2005 or six to uh, bring him to the Smithsonian and to have a small ceremony where he announced that he would be, that I, when, I, when the book was done, that I would turn over the transcripts and the tapes uh, to the Smithsonian Folklife Center. So, so I haven't done that yet, but they will, they will in fact get them. And, and for, for those of you who have students who might uh, know, uh, well, they have to know three languages. They have to know English, they have to know Japanese, and they have to know Pidgin. They have to know Hawaiian Creole English, uh, because um, a lot of the songs in, incorporate all, all of them. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of material in those tapes that I, that I did not use. And so this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. So maybe we can show this so you can um, actually hear the, the song. So it's a, just a five minute um, uh, sampler. It's a, a PBS documentary, which we hope will be aired uh, on PBS. And um, it's going to be narrated by uh, Jake Shimobukuro, the ukulele player.